Okay, so um, I'd like to uh, pick up where we left off on last time and sort of just, just quickly finish the story I was, I was telling you. So uh, what, we, what we did in the first two lectures is we built up sort of from scratch this Enion theory uh, for Fibonacci Enion. Uh, and, and the structure that comes out here is, is is the, the same structure for, for all theories that not have any of It's in some sense the, the simple, in some ways my ironic theory might be like the simpler thing. Uh, but um, the, for keeping that chaining there are only two possible topological charges, there are only two. one. Uh, there is, uh, I would argue, the simplest possible non of fusion rules. Uh, That's what Ben saw yesterday. Uh, fusion rule here, which tells you when you combine two keeping out they can either have total charge zero or total charge one. Uh, and as soon as we made that choice, everything else was fixed. Uh, we had to introduce an F matrix to have everything be consistent. We wanted to be able to uh, change the basis for our Hilbert space, the Hilbert space of our Fibonacci anions, in any arbitrary way and get the same answer. And that puts a strong uh, uh, constraint on this F matrix that people we used to make these basis changes. Uh, and if you did the homework, or uh, you, you found out that that has to have this form up to irrelevant phase factors, which are sort of just gauges. Uh, and uh, uh, likewise, we start talking about exchanging these particles. Uh, first of all, we have to distinguish between clockwise and counterclockwise exchanges of so these particles in two space dimensions. And the exchange, exchanges are characterized by this R matrix, which is again fixed by this uh, by uh, self consistent pentagon for F, the hexagon for, for uh, and, um And this is the sort of the bare bone structure you need to calculate anything, at least if you're interested in what happens when you start creating particles around each other. And so the task uh, uh, we set last time was to, was to, with these particles in this universe of Fibonacci anions, to build a quantum computer. And uh, we essentially finished that. I'll just remind you we had, so for single qubits, first of all, we can encode qubits, triplets of these particles with total charge one. There are two, then two possible states with, where the, labeled by the total charge of these two, say, bottom particles. And uh, by braiding uh, the anions within the qubit, in this case, maybe weaving this central particle around the other two. Um, we, I, I showed you explicitly, one can carry out arbitrary single qubit rotations. And, and, and not only that, you give me the single qubit rotation you want, and I can uh, um, come back and give you a, a braid that approximates it to whatever accuracy is required. Uh, and uh, then two qubit gates, now I, should, I think I went through one example of a two qubit gate, uh, the so what I call the controlled K and OT gate, with this effective braiding. And, uh, but once you understand the basic idea of that construction, then uh, there are, you can see there are many uh, uh, possible tricks for, for, for uh, constructing these two qubit gates. Um, and so here, for example, is, is an actual controlled knot gate. It's a little bit more complicated, but the one thing I would emphasize is, if you remember last time, a key feature was we, we braided a pair of particles from, from the control qubit around the, the, the particles in the target qubit. And we did it in such a way that we were always braiding three objects at a time, because that's the, 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 it's the when I'm braiding three things, that's when everything is, is under control. And I can calculate the braids to whatever accuracy is needed. In this case, it's, it's a little more complicated. There are three stages, but each stage involves braiding three objects, the pair and the other two particles. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in fact, in this way, we can construct essentially any controlled operation. Uh, just to, you know, once you, again, you can, there are lots of other constructions. This is even simpler. It turns out you don't need to braid the pair. You can just move a single particle. These are some other constructions. This is a recent construction, which, I, which uh, uh, is interesting uh, only because for this construction, we can actually, we don't need to do any numerical search. We can actually calculate the braiding pattern uh, analytically, um, which uh, something I never thought was possible, but it turns out there's a, some clever tricks that allow you to do that. Uh, but all of this is really just, this is just sort of quantum puzzle solving. You know, it's like solving quantum versions of a Rubik's Cube to get the, the two qubit gates you want. And the upshot is, these are the, once you have this dictionary that takes you from, qub from qubits to Fibonacci anions and from quantum gates to braids, then if you hand me any quantum circuit, for example, the quantum circuit that carries out Shor's algorithm or your favorite quantum algorithm, then we have, you know, we have a compiler that will compile it into a braid. The, the first we replace the qubits with, with uh, uh, triplets of Fibonacci anions, in, which are encoding the, the qubits, and then replace all of the uh, single qubit operations by braids and the two qubit gates by uh, 
these uh, weaving patterns where we weave one particle or a pair of particles from the control to the target. Uh, and so uh, in some sense, one of the things this picture provides is, is a visual proof of this statement that Fibonacci anions are universal for quantum computation. Because by construction, I, what I, I, I've shown you, you can do any quantum algorithm. We can translate any quantum algorithm into a braid for Fibonacci anions. Um, and that's not unique to Fibonacci anions, but there are many examples for which that's not true, including the, the Majorana fermions. Uh, and so at this point, I want to say a little bit, now that we've sort of, you've mastered Fibonacci anions, and, and at some point you might even have sat down and solved the Pentagon and Hexagon equation, so you totally own that theory. The, 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 uh, once you understand that, the, the, all the non-abelian anion theories are, they're, they're, no, they're no more complicated. They're just, they're more indices, that's all. Uh, and so let me say a little bit about uh, uh, other non-abelian theories, yeah. Is there a theorem or a paper that tells you if you have a circuit you want to implement, how accurate you need all the gates to Good be? Good question. So uh, there, there, it, it's a practical question, and uh, the answer is it depends, is it scales with the size of the problem. Uh, so let's say you want to factor some big integer, uh, say 128-bit uh, integer. I, I just use that number because I think off the top of my head I know you need something like 9 billion uh, quantum gates to do that. Um, and, uh, and each of those, and, and those gates don't have to be perfect. They just have to, it just has to be the case that when you've carried out the full computation, there's a finite probability you get the right answer. Uh, so for, if, if you have nine billion gates, each gate, the, the error should be, on the, should be no bigger than one over nine billion. Uh, um, uh, otherwise, you'd have to be, you'd worry about the, the errors accumulating. And, and if, you, if you stayed with that, let's say you, have, you, you, you compile these, these gates with this accuracy of one part in nine billion, and you scale up the size of the problem, you make the energy you want to solve factor bigger, then you have many more gates, and the error becomes of order one. It, it, the, the, so there's no, essentially, the, the probability of success goes to zero as the size of the problem grows. So the accuracy of the gates is determined by the, the, the size of the, the integer you want to, to factor. Uh, and so, so uh, let's see, am I explaining that clearly yeah. enough, or am I muddying the? I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, there are error correction codes that deal with when you have unknown wrongs, but here it's a known wrong. Ah, I see. Can you fix Unfortunately, that? there's no, yeah, there's no real, I mean, from the point of view of error correction, it isn't that different. I mean, it's true. So, so another way to put it is this is a systematic error. These are systematic errors. In, the, in this dream world where I'm assuming there's no decoherence, and so we're just, we have, we're carrying out unitary operations that just aren't exactly the same unitary operations we want. Uh, but from the point of view of error correction, I don't know whether it really makes that much difference, uh, that a systematic error and an error due to decoherence. Um, you could, I guess you could hope, well, I, in fact, there's some danger if you have systematic errors, they might all go, they might all add coherently for some, so there's probably more danger. Uh, uh, but, but the same reasoning still works here, that uh, essentially the, 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 what dictates how accurately you, you compile these, these gates is the size of the, the number of gates you actually have to carry out. You just have to make sure there's some finite probability you're going to get the, the right answer. So roughly the length of the braid is the, is the size of your integer grows, the length of the braids will grow logarithmically or polylogarithmically with the, with the size of the integer. Okay, so uh, I, I wanted to say something about uh, other non-abelian anion theories. Yes, sorry. So Abstractly, it basically turns out that uh, topological quantum computation is possible. So initialization and read-off are rotations along on the block sphere. So uh, with respect to the surface code, uh, like error correction and all that, so you need like simultaneous measurements of two qubits, and you, have, you need to have a surface code like kind of structure. So all the braiding requires like two qubits. And um. Let's see, I'm not sure, I, I maybe, uh, you mentioned the surface code. I mean, so at this stage, I'm just talking about, um, I imagine I have a collection so of these any. Error, error connection, uh, correction and so error correction. Yeah. Uh, okay. So to uh, minimize the error, so you, you require to measure like two qubits simultaneously, so that, uh, suppose you have x and z rotation. Yes, yes, yeah, you, well you have to perform, there are various measurements. Right. For the surface code, you have to measure things like uh, 
So actually, I'm going to be talking about things related to that later in the, in the talk. So maybe there might be a better time for this question. Uh, uh, um, yeah. Uh, how stable is the threading approximation? So if I want to simulate some scene of K, and you showed me the, how I have to braid, and suppose I make a mistake in the threading, do I get something completely different? You get something completely different. It's one, it's, it's, it's a very digital system. It's like the Rubik's Cube. If you know the sequence of moves to solve the Rubik's Cube, great. If you miss one, it's, you're, it, you know, it's not going to work. So they have to be, you know, you have to get every single one right. So getting one braid wrong is, a, is, a, is an error, catastrophic. Question? Uh, I'll go here and then. Yeah. Or some, uh, okay. So there, yeah. I, I always thought the point of using this fault tolerant hardware was to get below the threshold for error correction. So why are we even talking about how accurate we need to be without error correction? Surely the question should be, well, that's, so, um, so I guess so far I've been living in this dream world where there is no, there is no decoherence and making the point that, and certainly, the, I mean, the, I don't know if they still exist, but the hardcore topological quantum computing guys would say you don't have to worry about decoherence. It's protected from decoherence, and that's the advantage of this technique. The smarter guys, and they're all really smart, know that uh, that's, there's going to, I mean, you're still going to have to build on top of this error correction and that this is really improving the, improving the, the error, something you would use possibly to improve the error threshold. Um, so uh, the reason why we're talking about it is it's easier to talk about that first, I guess. Uh, but I, I, I agree in, in, if one envisions practically doing this. In fact, as I think one of the points I'll try to make, if one, to practically do this, I suspect if anything like this is ever done, it won't be done with a fractional quantum Hall state or some other. It'll actually be done on a quantum computer with errors, and the, tr the trick will be exactly what you, the goal will be exactly what you say to get below the error threshold. Okay, maybe, uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, the, just going back to that question about error that was here. You're saying that uh, each of the errors, if they add individually, you need uh, the error per gate to sort of go as one over the number of gates? Yeah. yeah. But that, is that just like the most conservative estimate? Yeah, I'm being like conservative. Yeah, so maybe there's a square root, which since it goes into a log, it's going to be a factor of two. Okay. Uh, but there, yeah, there probably is, there there should be a square root. Yeah. Are those? Are there? Is that a result that is known, or is that? Just well, uh, maybe by some. For me, I would be worried about. You know, it would depend on your algorithm. If you have a systematic error, you maybe have some algorithm where the gates are all the errors are adding coherently. I that's the sort of thing I worry about. Uh, maybe smarter people have figured out ways to. So certainly, in general, for some random set of random circuit, I would imagine you would get this square root. Um, but that's a practical question. When we build the machine, we'll find out. Maybe that's Very good follow -up. Does the, the to tie up exact, this, this nice method to make the gates more exact, does that allow you to kind of pick random errors, pick a few different ways to exactify it so that you get different X gates, for example? So that you missed by a little in different directions. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could do that. And so you could, if, you, if, you, if you're worried about what I just described, absolutely. Yes, you could imagine by hand just forcing it. So, so these are things that fu the future computer science students in the, in the late 21st century will be. Uh, they'll have to implement, maybe. Um, OK, so just a, a little bit about uh, other theories of not a million anions. It's motivated. Uh, uh, when we start with it, well, we started with the 12 fifth state as a possible uh, realization of the, of the so called Reed Rezai state. Uh, and, I, and I said that it's described by Fibonacci anions. A more accurate statement is the statistics are described by, by something called SU2 level 3 uh, uh, Chern Simons theory. Uh, and if you know what that means, and probably some of you do, great. If you don't, no problem, don't worry. Uh, uh, and in fact, the, the, in the Reed and Rezai proposed an, uh, an infinite sequence of fractional quantum Hall states labeled by an index K where one could get arbitrary SU2 level K churn simons theory. And the, the, the K equals 2 version of this wave function was the more read state. So K equals 2, SU2 level 2 is essentially the non-abelian statistics of Ising anions. So, so this family SU2 level K includes Ising anions and Fibonacci anions and an infinite number of other possible non-abelian anions. And in fact, one of the things that was proven in this paper by Freeman, Larson, and Wang is that the, these anions are universal for quantum computation for k equals 3. That's the Fibonacci case, which we've essentially just proved here. Uh, but not for k equals 2, more read. And for k greater than 4, so you can see k equals 4 is, is left out as well. 
Uh, so just a few words about SU2 level K. Uh, if you don't know what it is, the good news is before SU2 level K there was just good old SU2 and it isn't that much different. So I've sort of, I've been emphasizing some of the analogies between spin and these non-abelian particles and here it really uh, becomes quite clear. So if we have particles with ordinary spin, say, uh, say these green particles with spin one half particle, the, the allowed labels uh, uh, for these uh, spins are zero, one half, one, three halves, and so on. So there are an infinite number of possible spins. And there's a fusion rule, which is the triangle rule, which uh, 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 just tells you the, the standard rule for adding angular momentum. Uh, and the simplest example is the singlet triplet. If you combine two spin one half particles, you get either a singlet or a triplet. Uh, and, um, and again, that's very much analogous to what happens for, for, uh, for Fibonacci anions and for the Majorana of fermions. If you remember, if you have two Majorana of fermions, uh, you, you have two states because you have a single sort of fermionic mode that can be either occupied or unoccupied. Again, it's very similar to that. That's the SU2 level two version of this. Right, so, well, this is SU2. To go to SU2, ah, so before doing that, here's, let me just show you, we can draw one of these Bertelli diagrams. If you remember, this is similar to the diagram I showed you in the last lecture, where we label the total spin versus the number of particles. We have a bunch of spin one half particles. And, um, and again, the same trick works. Paths in this diagram correspond to distinct ways of labeling the total spins that are consistent with the, with the rule for, um, for adding angular momentum. And really here, it's just every time I add a spin one half particle, the spin can either increase by one half or decrease by one half, unless it happens to be zero, in which case it can only increase by one half. Uh, and so the, the, the same trick works to, to, to work out the degeneracies. You just have to count the path. So I won't, I'll spare you the exercise of doing it. You can just fill this out. Just count, essentially, each number here is the sum of the two numbers to the left. And so, for example, if anyone asks you how many uh, states are there with 10 spin 1 half particles which are, have total spin zero, the answer is 42. Um, and th these are the, the so-called Catalan numbers. And uh, so, anyway, that's the Hilbert space for, for spin, described entirely in terms of total spin quantum numbers. Now, for SU2 level k, what happens is uh, really not that much. The, 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 the spin is now, we will call it topological charge, and it gets truncated. Uh, so for, at level k, there's the highest possible charge of k over 2. So 0, 1 half, 1, 3, that's all the way to whatever k over 2 is. Uh, and so let's say our particle has topological charge 1 half. Um, the fusion rule uh, is, the, is, is a truncated version of the triangle rule, which, is, which ha among other things, has the property that you never produce, um, you never produce charges which are larger than this k over 2. Uh, but it's still true that if you have two of these objects with topological charge one half, they can combine to form either a charge zero or a charge one object. Okay, so, uh, yeah. I thought you said that the Fibonacci anions were like SU2 level three. I did. So then it seems like you have zero, one half, one. So it's not exactly the same. Let me, uh, uh, let me comment on that when I, when I get there. But it's, it's, it's morally the same, I would, I would argue. And certainly, it, so I'll explain that. So here's this Bertelli diagram showing uh, for ordinary spin, showing that the, and if you, you know, work out the dimensionality, as you might expect for n spin one half particles, rows is mm -hmm. two to the n. Uh, um, what, uh, if we have, say, SU2 level four, we truncate this uh, uh, diagram because there's a highest possible charge of, of two. And so the counting changes. And in fact, if you look at these numbers, one finds that they actually uh, scale as 3 to the n over 2. So they grow as square root of 3 to the n. So the, so the quantum dimension of these particles is square root of 3. Uh, k equals 3, this is what I was telling you, was Fibonacci. Uh, well, the first hint that I, I wasn't lying is if you fill in these numbers, you get the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. But you're quite right. It's different than what I was uh, uh, um, what I've been showing you so far, because I only had charges 0 and 1. Here there's charge 0, 1 half, 1, and 3 halves. So uh, what, I, what I will just tell you is it turns out there's, there's, you can assign equivalence classes. The charge 0 and charge 3 halves object, braid, it, it's braiding, not abelian braiding properties are, are those of, of a trivial object, uh, so of charge 0. And the charge 1 and 1 half also braid like a Fibonacci anion. The only difference is some overall abelian phase, which just, it's a phase factor which multiplies the whole wave function of the entire system, which just doesn't matter. So, so, um, so there's a, one has to do a little bit of massaging 
but it's, it's, it's not, I mean, to, to turn this into the simplest theory, which is zero and one, but it, it really just amounts to, to, to when, I talk, when I was talking about zero and one, I was really talking about equivalence classes of particles. I, when I said zero, I really meant zero or three halves. When I said one, I meant either one and one half. But otherwise, everything I, we did is perfectly valid for SU2 level three. So there's a picture of Fibonacci to endorse this, as the, these are Fibonacci ideas. For k equals two, uh, then, then it, uh, if you fill this out, you'll see, it's very easy to see, the Hilbert space dimensionality grows as two to the n over two, or square root of two to the n. The, the quantum dimension is square root of two. And this, in fact, this two to the n over two is showed up in, uh, in the talk uh, yesterday uh, about Majorana fermions. It's for the, the way the Hilbert space dimensionality grows. So the, ch the charge one half objects are the Ising anions. Uh, and uh, if we have two of these Ising anions, you, can either, you have this fermionic mode that can be either occupied or unoccupied, so it's zero and one. Uh, and uh, so there's a picture of Majorana. Uh, uh, it's th this theory, the theory of SU2 level two anions is, is essentially equivalent to the, the theory of Ising anions. Okay, uh, and uh, I'll just tell you, of course it's, more, it's a much more complicated subject. There are entire books on this. Uh, but it's really no, no, it, it's hard, no more complex than the, the F and R matrices we talked about for Fibonacci anions. There exist, you, there exist F matrices for, the, for SU2 level K, they're half, they're, they're must. Um, uh, and, uh, and there's R, an R matrix. Uh, and so, uh, and, and they all, and there, there's a pentagon and a hexagon and they're all satisfied. And there's again this rigidity, there may not, there may not be a unique solution given the fusion rules, but there's a finite number of solutions. Um, so, and I think to some extent that's, a, that's an unsolved problem, you know, whether uh, uh, how the number of solutions of the, of the Pentagon equation, say, grows with the, uh, depends on K. But for the, at least for the, K equal, for the Fibonacci case, it's a homework. You can make it a homework. Uh, so the, the point here is there's, you have, there's a full theory, and if we understand these, these reed rezaia states as at least one physical manifestation, if those states existed, the, the anions would in fact satisfy these statistics. So I can uh, play the same game we did last time and build a qubit out of these anions for arbitrary SU2 level K. Again, you, the simplest thing to do is to, is to build it out of three, three anions, yes? So with higher K, you still have only two charges, so... Yeah. Say again? With higher K, you still have... Uh, two, two charges only? No, no, no. For higher K, you have, you know, it's really, for the Fibonacci case, you could perform this, this, this equivalence mapping. Um, and in fact, for any odd K, you can do, you can reduce it, but not reduce it to two. So, so in general, there are, there, are money, there are more charges. So here, it's really, you know, here, in general, it's, I have, say, three charge one half. Uh, and this can be either a singlet or a triplet. And I insist the total charge be one half, or charge zero and charge one. This is equivalent to the qubit. Uh, you know, for the Fibonacci, I identify one half with one, so it's exactly the same. And in fact, this is this sort this is the sort of qubit that, that often when people are talking about building a computer out of Majorana fermions, it's the same either with three or maybe four. Maybe you have one pair and another pair of Majoranas. Uh, one pair isn't enough because there's no way to to because this 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 zero and one is this, is fixed by the parity. But if you, but uh, so this is this is the sort of qubit people talk about not just for Fibonacci but for, but for Majorana and and, the, and it generalizes completely to arbitrary SU two level K, and so I can uh, and so one can work out the the grade matrices the the matrix represent the matrix representations of the elementary grade operations and I can consider this weaving pattern so for K equals three these are the rotations I showed you last time. For k equals two, if you, you might know that these look suspiciously like they might be making right angles with each other. Um, uh, here's k equals four, k equals five. And again, I can just, uh, this, you know, just check and see what happens as I make the braid longer. Uh, of course, the number of braids grows exponentially. This is the same thing I was showing last time. The sphere of rotations fills up. It also does for k equals five. But for k equals four, for k equals two, it, st it stays fixed. Basically, we're done here. We're not going to generate any more rotations. This, uh, uh, um, and likewise, for k equals four. So again, this is another finite representation of the, uh, our finite subgroup of the rotation group. Uh, uh, but k equals three and k equals five, we can actually you know, perform arbitrary single qubit rotations. And this is, remember, k equals four is the case that Friedman, Larson, and Wang proved or are, was not universal, so that, this is consistent with that. 
uh, just uh, for kicks, here's k equals 6 through 9. And you can see they all fill up, except, except k equals 8. Oop, that's sort of a funny case because k equals 8, I forget what I should know. I'm, uh, I think it's the icosahedral group or something. Uh, uh, you can't perform arbitrary single qubit rotations, but nonetheless, it is universal for quantum computation. You just have to do, you know, you have to, you, because you can do, two, you can do arbitrary two qubit gates. Um, uh, so that's a funny case. Otherwise, uh, it, it, uh, all other k's are, will, will fill up the sphere and you can do arbitrary single qubit rotations. Uh, but but the, the, the practical, oops, go back here. The practical uh, point I want to make is, is it just, I'm just emphasizing this, this uh, well-known, I think, or, uh, or the fact that, that this is the advantage Fibonacci has over Majorana. The advantage Majorana has is it might actually exist, <laughs> um, uh, which is a pretty big advantage. Uh, it's not universal. That doesn't mean it isn't useful for quantum computation. It almost certainly is. You can't carry out arbitrary quantum computation by braiding, but you can carry out some quantum gates uh, 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 topologically. And then you just have to augment those with some non-topological gates uh, and, and, other, and other procedures uh, which, you can, which you can implement fault tolerantly. And the ultimate, and, and here the philosophy is, you, it's not as nice as Fibonacci, but you might still be able to use it to get below the, the error threshold. So it's certainly well worth pursuing. I'm not against at all. I mean, I, I, I won't, don't rule out the possibility that we'll see a Meyer on a fermion-based quantum computer at some point. Um, but the Fibonacci theory has, certainly has certain advantages. Uh, and that's why, and, and, and um, uh, oh, let me just, maybe. Yeah, so the, uh, here, um, just to show you, we can, we can also construct two qubit gates, in fact, for arbitrary SU2 level K. But, um, uh, sorry, but, to, but to, go, to go back to what I was uh, saying, uh, I think there's a case to be made. It's at least not, it's, it's not worth giving up completely on Fibonacci. And certainly people are thinking uh, uh, about, since there's, been, since there's been this explosion of success and in, in interesting, uh, just a wealth of ideas for realizing Majorana fermions, you know, why not try for some more exotic particle. And so there are these proposals for engineering Fibonacci anions uh, uh, yeah, in the same way that people are talking, are talking about and actually trying to engineer Majorana anions. Uh, and, but I, and I want to talk about something that's similar to that, but it's, 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 it's more, it's sort of, I'm going to kind of turn the tables now and imagine that uh, we actually have, we're not trying to build a quantum computer, we have a quantum computer. There are, the quantum computer is not perfect, there are errors, as there always will be, there's decoherence. And I want to use that quantum computer to essentially make Fibonacci anions. And then, with the idea being that I can then compute with those Fibonacci anions in the computer, and the computer will inherit the fault tolerance of the Fibonacci anions, and that way one might improve the, the error threshold. This is a work in progress, uh, and so, um, uh, I don't know the answer, whether it's possible, but I can at least tell you something about some of the ideas that show up when you start thinking about that. So I, I, this, is a, this would be uh, what could be called the surface code approach. This is my way, I mean, uh, a real quantum computing person might disagree with this, but my way of thinking about it, uh, the surface codes, is the idea is to use a quantum computer, computer to essentially, essentially simulate, as I was just saying, some theory of anions. And, and the simulation then inherits the fault tolerance of the anion theory, and, and so, even though the, there, there's decoherence occurring, if, if, as long as it's not bad enough, your, your computation will be, can, can be carried out to whatever accuracy is required. Now, the most promising approach by far, and in fact, where I would put all of my money if I had to, if, I, if someone said you have to invest in quantum computing, I would not invest in D-Wave. I, uh, 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 I would put it all in uh, people who are trying to build uh, quantum computer, computers using the surface code, the, the Kataev surface code. Uh, which is based on the Kataev Torah code, and, and for which the excitations are abelian anions. Uh, and th for that case, on paper, the theory is very well developed. There is a high error threshold at something like one part in a hundred. And as you know, people make, in particular with superconducting qubits, people are claiming, we're there, we're at the threshold, let's start building this thing. And so that might happen. Uh, uh, 
when you look at the details of the surface code, uh, it, it is, even though the, abelian, the anions are abelian, you can still use them to do, you can do, still do some, you can store information, you can, you can carry out some gates topologically, but not all of them. In some ways, it's very similar to the Majorana case. You have to augment, augment things with certain non-topological operations, which are very resource costly, as they are for the Majorana case as well. I mean, there is a price to be paid uh, for these, for these non-topological operations. So, um, you know, if one's mapping out the roadmap for future technologies, it's, it's certainly not, it's worth at least thinking about alternate ideas. You know, you never, you know, I assume that when, when people are charting out the next uh, advances in technology, they, they don't put all their eggs in one basket. They have, so people thinking about different possibilities. So I think it's certainly worth thinking, even at this early stage, about the possibility of, of having a, something like a surface code, but uh, with not, which has not a in any odds. So this is a more speculative idea, uh, only in the sense that uh, it hasn't been, the theory hasn't, I would say, hasn't been worked out completely to the point where we can say anything like what the error threshold is, or even if, the, if there is an error threshold. And really the, the, the main uh, uh, idea, and really the outline of this whole procedure is in this, in this paper here. Uh, and, um, and so this is what I, I want to, uh, and we've done some work trying to, figure out what, what, is, what is required to, to physically implement it. So that's what I would like to talk about. So I, I want to switch gears. Imagine we have an actual quantum computer with your favorite qubit, spin qubits, superconducting qubits, trapped ions, whatever. And let's imagine that we have, uh, and, and by a quantum computer I mean, that means we can do everything a quantum computer can do. We can initialize these qubits. We can carry out quantum gates. Uh, uh, I'll only require the gates to be you know, nearest neighbor, but, uh, um, or at least, uh, uh, local, um, and, uh, and also measure. Uh, and I've arranged the, so I've arranged this particular array in a Kagame lattice because if I uh, then draw a lattice where the qubits live on the edges, I get a hexagonal lattice, which is an example of a trivalent lattice. Uh, so, um, and, and uh, in, uh, often I won't be showing the qubits, so I need you to remember that the qubits live on the edges. I think in the world of condensed matter, usually the qubits live on the vertices, but in, quant in the quantum computing world, they live on the edges. So here, they live on the edges. I, so I, if, I'm not, if I'm not showing the qubits, you just have to remember each edge is associated with the qubit. Okay, so the reason I chose a trivalent lattice uh, is there exist, as, as some of you may know, there exist uh, model Hamiltonians. Uh, there's, in fact, an infinite class of these, these Hamiltonian so-called Levin-Wen models, which are realized on, on, on they can be realized on any trivalent two-dimensional lattice, including the, the hexagonal lattice. Uh, and these models are very nice. Basically, for any consistent theory of anions with an F matrix and fusion rules that satisfies the Pentagon and all that, uh, uh, you can input that data into the model, and out of the model pops uh, the anion theory, actually two copies of the anion theory. One you get because the model doesn't break time reversal symmetry, so you get both chiralities, which is potentially a problem, but, uh, but uh, it's really kind of miraculous. Uh, and so when I talk about the Fibonacci levin wen model, I'm talking about this, the specific levin wen model which, for which we realize Fibonacci anions. Uh, so these models have a, a, a form familiar, if you, if you know anything about the Kataev model, uh, they, 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 it's a sum over vertex operators, uh, QV, and, and here the vertices, uh, so the, the vertex operator acts on the three qubits on the, on the three edges that connect to a given vertex V. And it's, it's a projection operator, so the eigenvalues are zero and one. And a plaquette operator, and the plaquette operator acts on uh, the qubits associated with the edges of a, of a hexagonal plaquette, but this is an important point, not just those edges, but also the, the legs that stick out. So in fact, this is a 12 qubit, or if you think in terms of spin, a 12 spin operator. So it's, it's, it's a rather complicated thing. Uh, but they have nice properties. Uh, they all commute with each other. They're projection operators. They all commute with each other. So it's easy to solve the model to find the ground state. Uh, the ground state will just be the state which is a simultaneous eigenvalue, a sim simultaneous eigenstate of all the QVs and BPs with eigenvalues 1. So the ground state has QV equals 1 on each vertex and BP equals 1 on each plaquette. And, uh, um, and as I mentioned, the, the reason why we're interested in this is the excited states 
uh, uh, include Fibonacci anions. So um, let's so let's um, look at this model in a little bit more detail. For the Fibonacci case, so the vertex the vertex operator has a fairly simple form. It's 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 diagonal in the standard basis for the qubits. So i, j, and k label the qubit states here. And essentially what it says is, uh, um, uh, well, I can, I can just d describe what this, what this constraint uh, does here. If I represent, so thin lines represent qubits in the state 0. Thick lines rep represent qubits in the state 1. And qv equals 1 for any vertex which has, which, which uh, has, which, oh, sorry, qv equals 0 for any vertex which has one thick line um, uh, corresponding to a qubit in the state one and two zero two thin lines a qubit in the state zero. So you so so you don't you will have so forcing qv to be equal to one means the lines can't end, and that's in fact the only thing it means. Everything else is possible. You can have any number of of, of edges coming into a vertex be in the state one except for one, and so what that means is the configurations that are eigenstates of qv with qv equals one are are loop configurations are really branching loops. So it's not just a loop here. The loop can, can branch out like this. And in fact, uh, it's not an accident that this, this, this encodes the fusion rules of the Fibonacci anions. You can see, you can think of these, the, the, the lines in the state one as, as carrying charge one. So charge one, charge one. You can have either charge zero coming out or charge one, charge one, charge one coming out. So really, we built in the fusion rules of the Fibonacci anions, or that Levin and Wen did into this, uh, into this uh, vertex operator. So that's the vertex operator. That's, that's nice. And uh, the plaquette operator is another story. It's rather complicated. So I'm not, this is not meant for you to digest. It's just meant to uh, give you a sense of, of, of how complex it is. Uh, and uh, so for example, if you were to unpack this, I think probably to turn it into an actual spin Hamiltonian, it might fill several pages of physical review. Um, but uh, what, is, what the effect it has is, is, is so uh, VP commutes with the, the plaquette operator commutes with the vertex operator. So it, it just basically mixes. It leads to a particular quantum superposition of the, of the, of the configuration. So here are two configurations which satisfy Q, the QV equals 1 constraint on each vertex. And if we insist that VP equals 1 on each plaquette, we get some particular quantum superposition, which unfortunately, even though the model is exactly solvable, I can't write down a closed form expression for the, for the ground state wave function. Uh, but you get some, you know, you superposition over all of these states with, uh, that is uh, a simultaneous eigenstate of, of, of both BP and QV on each plaquette in each vertex with eigenvalue 1. Is there a proof that you can't write a closed form expression or do you just, is it just too complicated and you don't know how to do it? Uh, I might ask, I, so you might have a better answer. I, I don't know. I, I, so I, I don't know if there's a proof. Okay. Um, so maybe someone here does, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I, maybe there is. Uh, so I, yeah, I don't know. I confess I don't know. I know I don't know what it is. That I can state with certainty. <laughs> but I can work it out. You give me some. I, you know, I've done it in an exercise. You can work it out on small lattices and everything. And it's easy to. But then with small lattices, you can conjecture a form. Right? Yeah. So so. so like SCP level two is like root two to the number of. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't know. I probably shouldn't have made that statement since I'm, I'm not sure. But I, I just know I don't know how to do it. Um, OK, so this is a very complicated model, uh, in particular the plaquette operator. Uh, and, but one thing I'll point out in this complicated expression here is there's this f. And this f is really nothing more. It has a few more indices, but the indices really, the, the non-trivial content of this f, at least for Fibonacci anions, is the 2 by 2 matrix we've been using all along. This is the f matrix. So this is where one builds the f matrix into the, into the uh, structure of the model. OK. So again, the surface code approach is the idea, instead of trying to imagine physically realizing this Hamiltonian, or maybe more optimistically and more interestingly, finding some more reasonable Hamiltonian that is in the same phase. And that's possible. Uh, but certainly trying to engineer somehow uh, this 12-spin interaction. The different 
attitude. You don't have a Hamiltonian. You have your quantum computer, and you just keep measuring these operators. You keep measuring the vertex operator, and you measure the plaquette operator. And every time um, you find, if you find the vertex operator QB equals 1, if you're trying to keep the system in its ground state, so let's do that. For, if, let's first consider just the ground state. Then uh, uh, if you find QV uh, is equal to 1, good. If you find it's not equal to 1, it's an error, which you'll then have to, you'll then have to fix. But you have a quantum computer, so presumably you can, you can correct that error. Likewise, for the plaquette operator, you want to measure each, the plaquette operator BP on each plaquette. If it's one good, if it's not one, it's an error which you'll have to correct. Sir, yes. What's the reasoning behind using this hexagonal lattice? Well, it's this, I mean, it's a trivalent lattice. It's the it's the, really the simplest tri. It has to be a trivalent lattice. Uh, essentially, that's fixed because the vertex operator in, encodes these fusion rules. So you have yeah. two lines coming in, one line coming out. So in fact, eleven one models can only be defined on on, on trivalent yes, lattices. Yes, but, but Tori code is. The Tor code is the abelian Tor code. You can put put on a square lattice, obviously, or is on a square lattice. Yes. But um, and you can you can there's also there's a there's a, um, a, a hexagonal Tor code which you can actually map onto the or you you know you can map onto the square lattice. But it, it, at least from my point of view, when you do that, you're exploiting the fact that it's an abelian model. And in, in, in an abelian model, if I know the state of this qubit and this qubit, it fixes the state of this qubit. In the non-abelian model, I don't know what the state is, but the, the fact that it fixes that at least, you know, is, if I said, if you, you know, would allows me to sort of, I can take the square lattice and sort of add extra qubits to make it a trivalent lattice, and the state of those qubits are fixed because it's abelian. But for the non-abelian case, I, I don't know how to how to put it onto a onto a, a, a non-trivalent lattice. And also, what is the reason for considering those extra uh, qubits for the plaquette operator? Uh. I think we'll see that. Okay. Yeah, that's not that's not obvious. And you don't. And so another point is you're absolutely for the Kataev model and the Kataev okay. version of this. The abelian for abelian eleven one models you don't need them, but for the not abelian ones you do need them. And I suppose another one way one, okay, one I can answer that question by saying it really boils down to this fact that for the abelian models, if I know the state of this qubit and this qubit, I this the state of this qubit is fixed. So if I know the state of all six of these qubits, the other qubits are sort of our followers. They, they're, they're totally fixed. So, so in that case, you can see you won't have to, the, the Hamiltonian only has to act on the, uh, the, uh, those six qubits. For the not case, maybe case, maybe, you know, if these are all one, so I have a closed loop here, then each of these lines could be either zero or one. And so, and those all are all different cases. But I think it might even be, this might even become clearer in a second. Okay, so this is my so 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 this sort of raises a, a, a different question, uh, maybe a different engineering question, rather than the question of how hard is it to engineer a Levin one model, an actual ha system with a Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian one model. How hard is it to use it if you have a quantum computer to, to measure uh, QV and QT? So let me start with QV, and that's easy. This X is a, is a, is a, is a not operation. It's you know it's sigma x, the polymorphic sigma x. This is this this is a notation. Uh, so these are controlled not gates. This is a this is a Toffley gate or a Toffley class gate. It's a controlled 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 not. So this only performs a not operation on this qubit if these three qubits are in the state one. Otherwise, it does nothing. And um, the idea here is we have this extra qubit, a syndrome qubit which we initialize in the state zero. And if you run it through this quantum circuit, you can check that uh, when you measure it, if it's, if it's equal to zero, then QV was equal to one and the vertex constraint was satisfied. If it's equal to one, then QV was equal to zero and the vertex constraint is violated. So that's, it's easy to check, very simple. And in fact, the analogous circuit for the abelian model, you can get the analogous circuit for the abelian model just by throwing away this Toffley gate. And so this is, the circuits like this is what people use for the Kataev Tor code. It's just, just, these, just the sequence of control not gates. But um, the price we pay again for this non-abelian non models are these more complicated gates. But nonetheless, with a quantum computer, you'll, you'll have to be able to carry these out. For example, you can always carry this out. You can always write this in terms of some sequence of controlled not gates and single qubit operations. So that was easy. You can, you can just check for yourself uh, that the, the, the this circuit does indeed uh, do what I say, measures this uh, QB. But BP is this horrible 12-spin interaction. So um, how do we do that? So here's the problem. 
Here are the 12 qubits associated with the 12 edges. Um, sorry, the, the six plaquette edges and the, 12, the six legs. And let me put the qubits back in. So, let's, so imagine, the, you know, the, this doesn't have to be the case, but imagine the physical qubits are actually located here on these, on these edges. But in your computer, those qubits are fixed in space. But of course, the lattice is just something that exists in my head. Uh, so the, the trivalent lattice is abstract. And so no one, no one is telling me I can't redraw this lattice. So for example, I could, I could redraw the lattice like so, uh, focus on these five qubits here, and reconnect the, the lattice from here uh, like, like this. Okay, before you object, let me at least point out a good thing about doing this. Is if I do this, the six-sided plaquette has become a five-sided plaquette. And that's got to be easier than the six-sided plaquette. Okay, but your objection is that there's no free lunch, because obviously if I do this, uh, um, there's nothing, nothing so, so first of all, if I do this, it's still a trivalent lattice. There's still a Levin-1 model. Uh, uh, the Levin-1 model is still defined, but I'm certainly no longer going to be in the ground state of the Levin-1 model. If I'm in the ground state here and I just redraw the lattice like this, uh, I can't do that. But as long as I, uh, in the process while redrawing it, also carry out the appropriate unitary operation, then, um, uh, then actually one does stay in the uh, ground state. And this operation is, is, in fact, it really is essentially the same as the, the F uh, 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 operations we've been talking about. In this context, it's, it's an F move. So essentially, I'm, I'm redrawing the lattice, so the lattice locally, five qubits, qubits at a time like this. And if at the same time, I apply this unitary operation, and this is again, the, uh, the, this is the, essentially the F matrix. In fact, the only non-trivial case is when, when the qubits A, B, C, and D, these green qubits, are all in the state one. Uh, then this can be either in the state zero or one, and the two by two matrix here is in fact just the F matrix. If you, we've calculated. Uh, and it's a nice feature of these models that uh, as long as, when I redraw the lattice, as long as I uh, carry out this operation, which also happens to be a unitary operation, so that's what quantum computers are built to carry out unitary operations. With a quantum computer, I should be able to program it to, uh, to carry out this operation. Uh, and as long as I do that, then I'm okay. I can, I'm, I'm mapping the system from one ground state to the other. So all of a sudden, on my quantum computer, I've created this lattice, and then I, uh, I can change the lattice locally with these F moves, as long as I, as long as I carry out the right uh, sequence of quantum gates. And, and, so, and so that requires a quantum circuit representation of this, of this F. And, and here it is. It's, again, in terms of controlled knock gates and this Toffley gate. And then, and then here's, a, here's the real beast, the controlled, 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 controlled F. And F is this good old F matrix. Um, but nonetheless, with a quantum computer, you, you, you would be able to do this. And we can, you can compile this into just a bunch of controlled knock gates and single qubit operations. Uh, and so I've, let me introduce this, green, this notation. I don't want to keep writing this circuit. So this, this box you can think of as a subroutine in your quantum computer that carries out this algorithm, uh, carries out the sequence of quantum gates. So for example, if this is qubit 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, if I, I, for a quantum circuit, again, each of these lines represents a qubit, and these five lines represent these qubits, and I'll just and I'll label it A, B, C, D, E, consistent with this labeling here, uh, and and essentially just inside this green box, I just have to go back and look up this circuit and just wire it, wire these qubits according to this. But I don't want to have to keep writing that, so I'll just use these green boxes. Something else I'll, I'll point out is is a feature of this circuit is. The qubits 1, 2, 3, and 4 are really acting as control qubits. They, they, their state does not change. Uh, uh, but the state of qubit E changes depending on the state of qubits 1, 2, 3, and 4. OK. So with this F move and uh, F circuit in hand, we can go back to our plaquette. And I'll put the qubits back in. And then now I can carry out this F move as long as at the same time I'm carrying out this F quantum circuit. And I've turned the six, uh, the six-sided plaquette to a five-sided plaquette. Now I can do another F move and turn the five-sided plaquette into a four-sided plaquette. Four to three, three to two, two to one. So now I have a one-sided plaquette, and that's easy. Uh, but 
uh, before, before I show you that, uh, let me just quickly, I don't want to have to keep drawing these funny diagrams. So uh, I, I'm forced to draw this if I insist on having the edges pass through the qubits that are representing those edges. But of course, I don't have to do that. So it's, from now on, I'll just rep I'll represent sequences like that in this way. You just have, to, just have to remember that the edges are tied to qubits, which are fixed in space. So in reality, there's some funny picture like that. But, but in the end, it's, it's obviously much easier to just draw things that are topologically equivalent. So that's the same sequence of operations. So a two-qubit uh, single-sided plaquette, or we can call it a tadpole. And, um, and uh, this, uh, mm -hmm. the tadpole is easy to measure. I, just, I, 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 I won't bore you with this. It's easy to work out a quantum circuit. There is the levin wen models defined on this simple two-qubit system. You can work out the ground state, and this quantum circuit measures whether you're in the ground state or not. And so BP is equal to 1. If there's a syndrome qubit, BP is equal to, uh, if, if you measure 0, BP is equal to 1. You're in the levin wen ground state. BP equals 0, you're, uh, you're not. And uh, so you measure that, and then you undo this. And by the way, you can, you can see here, I don't know if this, this helps with your question, but this sequence of operations, I, ha I, always, I do have to act on the edge, the, the leg qubits. So sort of as a constructive proof that there's no getting around that, uh, you can see that here. Yes? So just so I understand what's going on, in order to measure BP naively, we'd have to make a 12 qubit measurement. But now instead, this plaquette decomposition allows you to break that up into a, sequence, a series of one qubit measurements. Is that it? Or two qubit measurements. Two qubit. Yeah, but I, of course, I, it's a, I have to act on all 12 qubits. So the circuit is acting on all 12 qubits. But at the end of the day, um, uh, uh, you know, you're, so we're, essentially what we're doing is disentangling those qubits and 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 uh, um, and, and um, pulling all of the entanglement, if you like, into this one tadpole. Is there a reason to believe that this is easier to implement than just doing all twelve at once? Well, uh, here's my reason. I don't know. I you know. So the reason why we came up with this is I couldn't. The question was, okay, how do you do all twelve at once? And we couldn't figure it out. I mean, it's a hard. That's a. I mean, it's so. So, I mean, you, you can imagine some just brute force method where you, this is the unitary operation you want and just sort of search over circuits. So there may be, so, in, and in fact, I, I may have time. There, there, uh, there's certainly, I'm not claiming this is the most efficient way. Our first goal was to have a way. Uh, um, but uh, no, by no means, in fact, I know for a fact this isn't the most efficient way. So in fact, this is what the circuit looks like. These are these, remember in each of these green boxes, there's that F circuit I showed you. Uh, and then this is the circuit that measures the, the tadpole. So this is, this is the plaquette reduction, measure the tadpole, plaquette reconstruction. And at least so this exercise at least allows us to have, give a first pass answer to the question of how hard is it to measure these, uh, 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 this, this operator. And uh, you know, so we can, if we unpack these green boxes and count the number of gates, in terms of Toffley gates, but maybe the, 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 the easiest thing to look at is just uh, the number of controlled knot gates and single qubit rotations required is still rather, rather daunting. Uh, uh, but then again, it, in some, you know, eventually quantum computers will, will, in fact, this may not be so, so difficult that it won't be done. This is the sort of thing one can do long before people factor an integer. People are going to be measuring these plaquette operators, first for the Kataev surface code, and maybe when they're bored or, or uh, they'll, They'll do it for a non-abelian uh, model. So, so at least this is also a toy experiment that you can do with your quantum computer. Once you have, well, you don't even need, you can do a smaller plaquette. You don't even need uh, 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 12 I'm, qubits. I'm a little bit confused what we are uh, trying to do. Yeah. Uh, so if I'm not wrong, as soon as we do the Hamiltonian, all the operators commute with each other. Yes. So at once we know all QVs and VPs are one. No, no, we, in the ground state, no, well, so the state. if we're in the ground state, they're yes. all one. Yes, the, the ground state is all one. Yes. And, uh, and you can keep on giving, increasing the values, like you can say one of them is minus one, so you get all the excited states as well, because they uh, well, all Well, but I don't, so that's another question, how to do that in a quantum, we have ideas for how to do that on a quantum computer, but that, it's not trivial how to actually do that. So, so, so here, you can imagine, I, I start, Let's, let's just talk about the ground state for the moment. Yeah. QV and BP is equal to one on each plaquette and each yeah. vertex yeah. everywhere. And um, uh, so, you, and, and, and I'm leaving aside the problem of how you initialize that state, but you can you can do that. Okay. 
But now there's, it's a real quantum computer, so there are errors. There's decoherence. Yeah. And those errors will manifest themselves in violations of these constraints, the vertex and plaquette constraints. You'll find after some time, if you measure the plaquettes, some of the plaquettes will have gone bad. The BP will be equal to zero. Uh, uh, and and so, so one of the things you'll have to do, this is what people do in the abelian surface code, or will be doing. You, you just keep measuring these operators, and, you, and when you find that the operator is, is no longer equal to one, that's an error, which you will then have to uh, uh, eliminate somehow. And, and the way you'll actually have to do that is you'll have to, these errors, for the non abelian models, the errors are non abelian anions, so you'll have to find some other non abelian anions and fuse them together and hope they go back into the vacuum. For the abelian models, they, you, know that you, you know if you have two of them, uh, you know, for the Gitaev model, if you have two magnetic excitations, let's say, they will fuse into the, you know, they're abelian, you know what happens when you're going to fuse them. So, but for non abelian, there's a, 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 there's a whole question of now, when you find the errors, what do you do with them? And even that's a harder problem for the non abelian models. But people are, are actually thinking about that now. Um, but, but for the moment, I'm dealing with, as I, I'm dealing with, the, with uh, one of the things you would have to do to carry out this kind of quantum computation. And that is, you, you certainly will have to be able to measure this operator BP with your quantum computer to find out if there's an error. QB also, but QB is much, is much easier. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. At least for the moment, I'm, I'm imagining I, I, I just want I just, to I just be able to measure these. Well, I really want to know how hard is it to measure these operators. Okay. Then I want to know, OK, if I find an error, how do I fix it? And uh, um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I just want to know what's the shape of your ground state? Is it just like Torico's sum over all loops or something? Well, that was a similar related question to what was asked over here, and I made the statement. I it, it is this is a sum over these configurations, but, it's not but I don't know what the coefficients in front of each of the terms are. I can write them down for the Kitaev model. Yeah. For the but I can't for this eleven Fibonacci yeah. eleven one model. And the same question, the same, uh, and the other question is, do you need to put it on some torus or some non? non uh, get, uh, no, you don't. And it's, so, for example, even for the abelian case, you don't have to do that. It's called the surface code because it, actually the qubits are associated with boundaries. So you don't have to. It doesn't have to be a, on, on a torus, but it, it's topologically non-trivial in the sense you have holes. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, so, and here we don't we don't need that. No. Oh. Uh, so it doesn't have to be on a torus. It just it just. Uh, uh, um, and the, the reason is because here the philosophy is we want to create anions and move them, braid them. I want to carry out these braids I've been showing you. Uh, and so that doesn't require, uh, you know, a, a putting the, the code on some topologically non-trivial surface. Or holes. Or holes. It does, yeah, well, I don't think it requires holes. Oh. They should be different. I mean, fundamentally different. What should be fundamentally different? Uh, compared to this story code. Oh yeah, it's it's non abelian. The difference is it's non abelian. Yeah. yeah. Does this give you some kind of protection against uh, stray anions from thermal excitations? Uh, can keep measuring. I think this is yeah. I think the answer is yes. This is a way to measure the you know if, if anions are created through thermal excitations, you would see them here yeah. because anions anions again. Well, in fact, that's what if once you're in the ground state, all errors look like anions. Uh, um, you know, and, and so this is a way to detect anions, the stray anions. This is exactly that. So this is what, that's a better way to say what this is designed to do. I mean, the plaquette error turns out in these models, they're so-called doubled models. So the plaquette error is actually a bound state of the two, chiral two different Fibonacci anions with different chiralities, but it's, uh, that's a detail. Um, let's see, uh, I think I have time. Just very quickly, so just, uh, I'll just show you, once you understand that, let me show you another procedure, uh, which, which I like because it seems a little bit like a magic trick. Um, so again, here's a plaquette. I don't know what the, the BP value is. And uh, so here's a procedure where, where we can actually uh, imagine correcting the error, if there is one. And so here the idea is we, we actually, we freshly initialize a tadpole, one of these two qubit um, uh, so we have two extra qubits, and actually we need a third extra qubit here to rep because if we have this edge coming in here, I now have two qubits here instead of one. So there's three extra qubits. Uh, so I, I and, and this qubit I just initialized to be an 11 one ground state. So I make a good qubit, a good one-sided plaquette. 
and I just insert it into the plaquette. I don't know the plaquette, the state of which I don't know. And so, okay, so I, I know BP equals one in this tiny little plaquette, and I don't know what BP is in the big plaquette. Now watch this. Through a sequence of F moves, I can make the plaquette I know bigger and the plaquette I don't know smaller until now um, I know what the big plaquette is. It's BP equals one. But I, I, know, I don't know what the small plaquette is. But that, then I can measure it using that little quantum circuit I showed you and determine if there was an error. So here's the circuit that does that. It's actually, it is a simpler circuit. It's really half the size because we don't have to reconstruct the plaquette. So this is at least one proof, that, and I imagine there are even simpler ways to do this. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, this is the, I think this is, in the end, the natural way to do this, in part because this also, if you consider doing the analogous thing for the abelian models, it, it reduces to what people actually talk about doing in the abelian surface code. But then the question is, what hap now how do you, what do you do now? If you measure it and you find there's no error, then you're done. You can just remove the, you know, the tadpole, and you have a nice, uh, fresh, uh, Okay. But if there was uh, an error, then uh, you can't just remove it. Uh, the best you can do is move it. So through a sequence of F moves, I can move it, and I can pull it out of the plaquette at least. Move it over there. So now at least this plaquette is fine, but I still have this unsightly error. And this error, this error you're going to have to move through the lattice and find some other error, which you will then fuse it. And then, because they're not abelian, you don't know what they're going to fuse to. You have to hope they fuse to, to, to the vacuum. <laughs> so um, uh, these are all, uh, uh, so, so these are things we're, we're working on, I would say, the, the, the you know, I, uh, um, procedures for how, for how to do that. Um, let's see, I think, how am I doing the time? Let me, I think I can show you this as well. Uh, the circuits I showed you are very, very complicated circuits. So uh, although I think it's possible, again, when, pe when people, I think we are going to enter the age of the 12 and 15 qubit quantum computer. And so and, and you'll be able to use that to do lots of things, including play these games with, with at least small games with these not a billion circuits. And a particularly nice circuit is one which, which course, uh, corresponds to, you can just imagine, uh, just imagine this is a lattice in a 11 one model, it's a trivalent lattice with seven qubits. And we can carry out a sequence of F moves, which um, you might uh, recognize. This is, this, this is the Pentagon equation that we saw in the first lecture. It might look a little bit different. It, it wouldn't look different if I'd used, uh, as I probably should have, used this fusion tree notation instead of these ovals, where the, the, you know, the anions you know, you, you have lines like this which indicate how the anion, what the anions fuse into. Um, uh, but you can think of this, this picture here is essentially a state where, uh, where I have an oval around these two, then these three, and then these four, where the ovals correspond to the order in which you, you fuse the, the anions. Or you can just think of it, as I said, as just a seven qubit lattice. Uh, and if you're someone who has access to a seven qubit quantum computer, you could, this is what, you know, you, just, you, just, you assign each of those qubits to, to these lattice edges and carry out these, the sequence of F moves. And you can see after carrying out these five moves, the, the lattice has indeed come back to the same lattice. That's, remember the Pentagon equation had this, had this coherence. There were two ways. I mean, I, I, it's, it's like the Pentagon equation except I'm going the same way all the way around. Um, uh, but if you look, at, look closely, there's an interesting thing that happens here. These two qubits are swapped if you follow the, the process. It's maybe hard to see, but if you can, you can convince yourself. And uh, that's actually really, that, that's, this swap is directly connected to the fact that the, you know, if you check the determinant of the F matrix, it's minus one and not one. Um, anyway, uh, so this is a, this, I can translate this into a quantum circuit. And this is, so this is, one can turn the Pentagon equation into a quantum circuit. So again, if you, if you, if you have a seven qubit quantum computer and you want to write a paper, Submit it to Nature, saying we verified the Pentagon equation with a quantum computer. Probably wouldn't get in, but maybe uh, 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 we, you know, we have a circuit that does that. Just again, these are these after the sequence of F moves. But this circuit is very complicated. Actually, at its heart, remember I, I told you the only the, 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 these qubits, all the, the qubits with black labels are control qubits. They don't change. They only alter the state of the red qubit. 
so living inside this is really a simpler circuit. If I set all of these qubits to one, one gets this circuit here, just a sequence of controlled f. Again, f is the same f. And this sequence of alternating controlled f gates is, is equal to a swap. And uh, I don't know if this means anything, but it's sort of, uh, it turns out, this is, again, mathematically equivalent to the Pentagon equation. It's mathematically equivalent to the homework problem. If you did the first homework problem, you worked out this, you basically solved this circuit. Okay, so um, in the remaining time, let's, let's try to create some anions and move them around each other. So, uh, and here I, I'm, I'm following essentially the procedure that was outlined in this Conan Cooper Burger paper. So here's our trivalent lattice. And imagine we actually have these vertex and plaquette operators measurements running all the time and checking and seeing if there are errors, finding them, fusing them together, and, and uh, keeping everything in the ground state. Um, then, uh, uh, now, if I allow for uh, violations of the vertex constraints, so QV equals zero, say here and here, then I have these, then I have, so, so you know, regions which are in the ground state will always be, well, there'll be superpositions of these branching loop configurations. So I, this is just a snapshot. And where the vertex constraint, uh, where you have vertex errors, the string ends, and on, and on those ends live Fibonacci anions. Now, there is this subtlety that there are two, there, we get two chiralities of Fibonacci anions. But there, there are, I think, ways to, 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 uh, to deal with that. But, uh, um, uh, but for our purposes, just, just uh, uh, it's the, essentially the essential point is that the vertex errors are people not many. Uh, and so um, one can, just in the quantum computer, just start, you know, just insist that QB equals, equals zero here and here, for example. So now how do I move them around each other? Uh, let me show you one way to do that. And again, this is, this is, uh, this is due to Kona, Cooperberg, and Reichardt. And, uh, so uh, I have two, imagine these are two anions, two points where the vertex constraint is, uh, is uh, not satisfied. And uh, imagine my only resource is this F move. So, uh, and I made them different colors because so you, you're going to have to keep track of them. Remember, the blue one's up here, the green one's down there. So let, let's, let me, so, and, and also this purple will, is a good guy to the eye. Okay, so over here, these, for these qubits over here, these five qubits, let me do an F move, something I can do in my quantum computer, just redraw the lattice, like that, okay. And here, here's one, two, three more uh, F moves. I'll do them all at once. And here's one, two, three, four more F moves. I'll do them all at once. And now, um, I'm not doing anything, I'm just sort of, I mean, I, I haven't changed the topology of the lattice, I've just relaxed it a little bit. Now, I, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't have the patience to keep drawing, so now this is after, uh, I guess, uh, 24 more of these F moves. And then, and then uh, now after a total of 48 F moves, we're here. And then I'll do the rest. There are three here. And then there's one, two, three, four, five here. So a total of 56 F moves. And now I'm not going to do anything else. I'll just let it relax a little. And if you remember, when we started, this was blue, this was green. Now this is green, this is blue. So this is, I guess, what topologists call a Dane twist. And, and we've braided the, the particles. But we've braided it sort of, we've braided it by reaching into space and time and warping it at, with our will, something like that. So, um, uh, so this is at least a, a procedure that which one can at least imagine. In fact, if you have a quantum computer, you will be able to do this. Uh, well, I don't know, but here's, let me show you how, how I can understand it. So I show you this picture, it's very hard to see, right, very complicated, but I can make it look much simpler. So if you stare at this, hexag this is a hexagonal lattice, I'm going to show you another lattice which is topologically equivalent. It's, it's, it's just, the, the connectivity is the same, it's just redrawn. Ready? There. It's the same lattice. And to see that, just notice each plaquette has one, two, three, four, five, six sides. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, it's the same lattice, just drawn differently. And now I'll show you what the, the sequence of F moves, which look very strange in the hexagonal lattice, what it looks like here. Okay, ready? <laughs> <laughs> so probably the smarter people in the world know this, and then they 
they they don't tell you that, and then uh, <laughs> and you think they're crap. Oh, anyway. um, Can you do it one more time? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think that's, uh, that's where I'm going to stop. Uh, I also wanted to, I mean, of course, these are I, uh, standard reviews on, on topological quantum computing. I also, for Fibonacci anions, I very strongly recommend these lecture notes of John Preskill's, which people, I imagine, have, have seen. But if you haven't, I really very strongly recommend those. Uh, so that's it, yes? Uh, does this mean that we can generate an R matrix with a series of... Excellent question. Well, there is this issue I mentioned, the enions, it's a, this, this so-called double theory, the enions could be, um, could be have, they can have different chiralities. Now, it turns out, if I, if, I, if I solve the problem, which I haven't talked about here, of fixing the chirality, I have to use R. So, so far it's true, I haven't used R. Um, uh, and uh, so, but it's true, but once I create, so to create, so to create a, an enion of a particular chirality, I need R. It, it, something has to enter that fixes the chirality. But once I've done that, once I've created that enion with a particular chirality, then this procedure will, will uh, so that the, the, the chirality is built into the wave function now. So the Fs are time, you know, the, the Fs are real value uh, unitary operations, but uh, the, the twisting property will in fact produce the, the appropriate chirality. But R is there. You, you, uh, um, and in something, I mean, it does sort of emerge here. You get, you, it's true, you get, I, you get eigenstates of this twist. So the, 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 the any kinds of di different chiralities are eigenstates of this twist operator. Um, and, um, and you get both, both, uh, both chiralities. Um, but, well, as I say, if you want to, if you want to physically create an, uh, an R, uh, sorry, uh, one of a particular chirality, you need, to somehow, you need to actually build that into the wave function. But it is true that you, 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 can, you can, once you've done that, then uh, R is somehow there. Yeah. So the resource state here is an excited state. Say again? The resource state for quantum computation. Yeah, yes, state. yes, yes, yes. Isn't that hard? Because usually you use a gap for prediction. Well, so this is, it's even worse than that because remember, I'm not even imagining there's a Hamiltonian here. I've, I've, uh, the, we just have a bunch of qubits that I can control with my quantum computer. So it's a different philosophy. Rather than engineering a Hamiltonian with, although I, I should say, one can hope that maybe one can, one can do that. In fact, in, you know, in the fullness of time, future technology may be a combination of actually engineering some Hamiltonian that, that produces this gap together with this, these manipulations might work. But, but at least at one level here, I'm, uh, when people talk about the surface code or the abelian surface code also, they're not envisioning in general, they're not envisioning engineering the Gatea of Hamiltonian and, and using the gap. They're using the properties of, the, of these states uh, um, uh, to do quantum error correction. So, um, but I mean, but, but, but also, I mean, if you have, even if you have a collection of these, if you imagine you could engineer this Hamiltonian and trap these, these enions, the gap is still protecting you because you, you have the enions you want. You can create these excited states and you, let's say you, you just, you hold them in place somehow. The gap is still preventing other unwanted enions from popping out of the vacuum and causing errors. So you still get some protection if, 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 you, if you actually, you know, so that's sort of the generic topological quantum computing idea is you have, a, you have a Hamiltonian with a gap and you create some number of excitations. And then you just hope that the excitation you don't know about, which by the way is manifestly un untrue. I mean, it's, even if you have a gap at finite temperature, there'll be even if the gap, you know, there'll be some finite density of quasi, thermally excited quasi-particle quasi-whole pairs. And that's enough to eventually lead to a catastrophic error. That's why I think even for, even for the dream of topological quantum computation, you still would need error correction. And, and so people, and, 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 and in fact, you would need not a billion error correction where you have to deal with these issues I was talking about, how the errors now are, you know, the, the particles you, you compute with are not a billion anions. You like them, you weave them around each other. Then there are errors, which are other non-abelian enions you don't like, and you have to somehow get rid of them. And getting rid of non-abelian enions is harder than getting rid of abelian enions. But these are, yeah, these are unsolved pro or problems that are people are working on. Could, could you elaborate on how these sort of simulated anions inherit the fault tolerance of real anions? Because it seems like um, you still have to do like quantum error correction. So it, naively, it seems to me like it's maybe more 
computationally intensive or complicated to try to simulate anions rather than just do operations on normal qubits and do error correction. So what advantages does this? Well, this is, I guess this is a kind of error, this is a flavor of error correction. Error correction. So the surface code is also a flavor of error correction and it's the flavor of the month because, because of this the result that the error threshold, you know, when, when quantum computing first appeared, the, error, the, 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 the standard error correction protocols that people talked about required one part of 10 to the fifth accuracy for your quantum gates. And your your, and your, co your qubits had to maintain coherence to one part in ten to the fifth, yeah. and that number, through at least on paper, has reduced to one part in ten to the two, one in a hundred, and that's because of the surface codes. Okay. So, um, and the the flip side is, you know, and like like I say, the, the the problem with error correction here is is connected to the error correction, which I think will still be present in in sort of vanilla topological quantum computation, where you actually had some state of matter with a gap because of these thermally excited. Uh, uh, not abelian anions, which are, which are going to cause errors if you don't somehow get rid of them. So, so, but maybe the better answer to your question is really this is using ideas from topological quantum computation and topological order to think up new error codes. And the advantage of this, of the, of the non abelian error code, the potential advantage is the universality of braiding. The fact that we can carry out arbitrary quantum computations by braiding. That's not true for, for the abelian surface code. And it's not true for the for Majorana Fermi. So there's, that's why it's it's worth at least thinking about the Fibonacci case, because there's there may, there's a trade-off. The circuits are more complicated, but the the anions are more computationally powerful. So you could have sort of dreamed up this team, even if you didn't know. About in an alternate universe, yeah, in an alternate universe without the fractional quantum Hall effect. Quantum error correction, you could have. Yeah. I think that you can imagine it would be a strange universe where computer scientists discovered topological order. Yeah. Uh, um, but that's, it's hard to imagine. But. <laughs> Any more questions? If not, let us thank Professor Gouldi. On behalf of PCCM and PCTS, oh. I would like to give this present to you. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. Very nice. Oh, <laughs> The Daily Show. Institute for Advanced Study, excellent, and fantastic, an unbreakable coffee mug, without a topologically trivial coffee mug. Thank you.